When I think about leaving my legacy, I think about leaving music that's just timeless, you know, that can be played from generation to generation. I remember sitting back after I wrote everything, I just said to myself, I finally did it. I wanted to show my true colors with full-on production, which is, for me, everything that I want to accomplish as a producer. This track is the first track I made for the album. I remember I was playing Time Warp, I think it was two or three years ago, I forgot. The last one that was in New York before this one. Eric was playing and it was right before Innocence came out. So like I was planning on giving Eric like a whole new batch of records and we're talking, we're just bullshitting. He's like, yo, I want to hear some different stuff from you. And he was putting me up for a challenge. So this track I probably made almost two years ago, maybe, or a year and a half ago. And um, this track started off with this sound. Not this sound, where is it? This whole thing. I don't know what it was like in my mind, like how just the one note inspired me. This note inspired me. And I, I, I think I started off like how the intro starts off on the track. Like it's kind of pretty much how I produce the record. So it's like, it starts off with, you know, some ambiance you got the pads in the background panning this track is like the perfect example of how my sound works it's like you got a, a really groovy bass line like a housey or a disco bass line with the balls of techno and um i think that's like the new yorker in me is like i i like things that have a little bit more deepness to them or a little bit more heaviness to the sound so this track kind of just keeps evolving and keeps changing. I wanted to like build the journey up and down and create a ride for the listener, you know? So like the vocals is on me here. And I just added like some chorus, echo, filters. Like I didn't want the vocal to be too like out there i kind of want it to be hidden and what the vocal says is you send me through the night all i want is the light so that's where i came up with the title contrast because light and you know the darkness there's a lot going on though and it was important for me to like really show like the true um sounds coming out like I didn't want it to sound too cluttered I wanted everything to have its space for me it's another record that I'm like super proud of as a producer um, it touches another side that I really haven't put out there and you know it's a little bit more musical and and that's why I, I tend to like really be proud of it you know it's got a groovy bass line it's got a ton of synth work in it vocals everything that Eric kind of pushed me for it it had in there and like for me I don't think I can make a better example of a record that I would want to share. All right, so we're in Staten Island, New York. This is the birthplace where I grew up, where everything started for me as a kid. And um, we're in Annadale, New York, uh, Staten Island. And I haven't been, I mean, I've checked in on like my original house where I grew up like here and there, but I haven't like walked this block or anything and probably since I moved like 20 years ago. But uh, this was the stomping grounds. This is where I learned how to pretty much be a musician, learn how to play baseball, everything. So it's gonna be uh, pretty cool to see everything. All right, so this is Worley Avenue. This is the block I grew up on. It's the first house that I ever lived in and um, I haven't been on this block probably in like 20 years. I remember I would ride my big wheel up this block, learned how to ride a bike on this block, learned how to hit a baseball, throw a baseball. It just makes you super grateful for realizing like how I was brought up and 
you know, having supportive parents and making sure, you know, your dreams come alive when you're that young. This is the house. It's getting actually rebuilt, it looks like. Certain things are getting redone. That garage was actually a studio that my dad built. There was a little section of the garage and then behind that was uh, the basement and then the studio. As a kid, you know, I would go down there in the studio that my dad built and uh, I would jam out with him. I'd play drums, he would play keyboards, he'd sing. It's just like amazing memories, you know, nothing but amazing times in that studio and in this house. It's crazy to look at now and like this block used to just feel so much bigger. It used to be like the biggest block in my eyes. And to come back now 20 years later and just look at it and realize what you had was so special, it's, it's, a, it's a nice moment, you know? All I can remember back then was he would be blasting like the the top 40 house tracks of that time. So like I remember like when CC Pettison came out with her album and I remember him playing uh, We Got a Love Thing. That was like my introduction to like house music. It was like at that time growing up in the early 90s, house music was the shit. It was it was everything. You had so many radio hits that were house tracks. You know, being from Staten Island, New York, it was a big thing. New York was on another level when it came to house music at that time. So being so young and getting introduced to that style of music at a young age kind of just stuck with me for the rest of my life, clearly. This record's called Cut the Rope. Originally, I didn't have this record with the vocal at all. I made this, this was the last record I made on the album and it was like a late edition because it just came out really dope. It's called Cut the Rope because Robert Owens, the uh, the vocalist on the uh, record, was the one that came up with that and I want to thank him. He's an absolute legend. So to have him on the record is super important to me and he's made classic after classic and to just have someone respect me like that and, and come on board for a part of my album is is major for me i think it really like completed the whole picture for the album for me like i always wanted someone fresh and up and coming on the album and then i wanted uh, a legendary artist to come on board and and you know show that i have respect for the people that paved the path before me so to have Robert is a, a major, major blessing. So I would just want to thank him for that. So I wrote this track without the vocal and he came in and wrote the vocal after I sent him everything. So started off with a good drum groove. I wanted to keep this one like pretty housey, upbeat, kind of like a futuristic, like disco type of deal. So without the vocal, it's a good record, but it's not as special. And I knew it needed a vocal. And I remember showing this track to one of my boys. And I'm like, yo, I need a vocal on this. And he was actually the one that said Robert Owens. And it, it flipped a switch right in my head. I was like super happy he mentioned that. And so right away, I hit Robert on uh, Instagram, you know, linked the team with his team and we made it happen. And I'm just going to solo his vocal out real quick so you can get an idea of like all the emotion and the lyrics behind it. The lyrics to me seem like he's coming from a place where it's like he had to take himself out of his situation and he had to do what's right for him. The vocals have a really nice meaning to it. So, I mean, I think the cut the rope means like you cut that relationship or you cut that tie with someone or that something. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. You see, I've always understood how to get back to reason and purpose. If I've ever lost my way. You could actually hear him flipping pages in this acapella, which is pretty cool. And I didn't edit that out. I thought it was, you know, you barely hear it anyway in the record, but I just thought that was pretty cool. Um, this is the first verse. That was the last verse. So many times in life, I've been compelled to do 
was right for me. Fool, the 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 fool, So it's got like a hypnotic, I think I called this in the beginning, it's called hypnotic future or something like that. It's got like this hypnotic sound to it. Like I think the way I went from major chords to minor chords and stuff like that, it just gives this like little feel to it. But like the minute he sent me this vocal, there was like, I think he sent 30 vocal clips. And um, it was great because I was able to just pick and choose where I wanted to go with it and just write the the record over again pretty much so i i saw his vocal i kind of deconstructed the whole track and then came back and started adding more pieces to the puzzle hearing this track out live and just hearing this part right here just i don't know it has that big big vibe to it that just crushes the dance floor i remember i made this on my laptop in was in i think san diego we were playing a show i was playing with eric mesioplex i had this groove going and i literally wrote it on the keyboard the magic keyboard in logic which enables you to just use your computer keyboard to make parts and i had this groove going and i was like really inspired at the time because i was playing a few shows and it was really great i pumped this out and then the minute robert sent me back the tracks it was probably about like maybe two weeks later Maceo Plex was playing at Brooklyn Mirage when I finished this and I dropped him the the WAV file and he played it live and it just went off. And that's when I knew, I was like, I gotta have this record on my album. Like, there's no way else to put this out. Um, and it has that like underground feel plus up and vibrant feel, which I really wanted another vocal record on the album. So it, it's it's perfect. All right, so we're at Club Abyss. Well, it's formerly Club Abyss. Now it's called uh, Pure. It's an event space now. But um, this is pretty much where I got my start as a nightlife DJ, as a club DJ. I was 15 years old. One of my best friends now, his name is Nero. He was managing me at the time. He started a promo crew called XF. And um, he was the biggest promoter here. And he had the pull to get me in. And he was fascinated by like my music at such a young age and all those little things that, you know, helps build an artist. And um, he got me my residency here as soon as I turned around 15, 16 years old. At that time, I was making music under my real name. And it was just a different experience back then. You know, it was so fresh and so new and everything just felt so amazing like I was just so fascinated by the club scene and I remember coming here before I even started DJing it was like maybe about a month or two before I started DJing and I came here with my boy Mike and we were sitting online and there used to be a line wrapped around the building all the way down and um, I mean we would pack probably a thousand kids in here 1500 kids no problem I remember there was an accident on the highway and my first time being online, everyone was stopping to look at the accident. We cut the line. And I remember hearing the sound system and just being outside so excited to just go inside a real club because there was only like a few tea nights in the area. There was Surf Club in Seaside, there was Jenks in Point Pleasant, and then there was Club Abyss. And then every so often, Pasha would do a tea night as well. So like, I remember coming to Abyss for the first time and saying like, wow, I, I have to be a part of this. I have to be a DJ here. And uh, sure enough, little did I know, like two months later, I was one of their residents. And it lasted for about two years until I was about 17. 
and then we moved over to Deco Lounge. So it's a little set up differently than it used to be. You would walk in from the main room, like from the entrance, there would be a whole bar here, and then it was like a VIP section where the original DJ booth for Teen Nights was. And that's where the first spot I DJed was. It was on that back left corner. And then, um, I mean, the sound, it's, the sound system's still here, which is pretty cool. Um, they use this now as an event space, so it looks a little bit different. But um, this room would be packed with at least a thousand kids on a, on a slower night, I would say. Like, we would pack this shit out. I mean, this was like the true learning experience for me as a DJ. Like, I was kind of spoiled as a kid just because I was playing for pack nights almost every month. You know, we would do, I think, once or twice a month, and then in the summer it was weekly. And I was super spoiled. So many amazing nights here, like, insane i remember coming home and like being so inspired i'd go into the studio until like three o'clock four o'clock in the morning my dad would pick me up here around like one or two and i'd go straight back into the studio and start making tracks and at that time it was a huge uh, movement i would say like there was kids that wanted to know like the unreleased tracks that you were playing it was very true to adult nightlife you know when a new york dj would play a record and no one knew it they would want to go find out what that record was and it was pretty similar here like it was the truest form i think of a teen night comparing it to a, an adult night like it was super proper it almost primed us for nightlife now a few of my other dj buddies um my buddy 4b he has a career now too, and it's, it's crazy to see how we all started in, in the same building and we all kind of evolved together in certain, well, in different areas, you know. We're gonna go down to the basement where most of the hip hop was played. So there would be hip hop on the basement floor, Jersey Club, and then it would be house music upstairs. And um, the basement was a whole other vibe. I would say um, you, you would come down here, you would put your hands on the railings and you start feeling the moisture just from how hot it was. When you would come downstairs, my boy uh, 4B was playing. I think I played down here once or twice, but it was, a, it was its own club down here. It was a separate host. Um, separate kids would just come for the basement floor and then separate kids would go just for the upstairs, but it didn't matter. It was a whole community. Like, and I think that's why we were kind of spoiled as kids too, is like we had such a different variety of music to listen to and you had a little bit of everything. And that's why I kind of liked, you know, playing here so much is because if you got tired of the house room, you come downstairs, you listen to hip hop. And if you got tired of the hip hop, you go upstairs and listen to house. It's just a, a sick vibe overall in both rooms. <laughs> So this one, probably the most fun record on the album. Everyone's been asking me for this one. March during the pandemic, like when everything was going down, I think I made this one right before in my mind. I didn't think like this would go on my album originally. And I don't know why I thought that, but I was watching The Sopranos. This record comes on the original and uh, I'm like, shit, I forgot about that record. Like I forgot about that whole track and it happened so naturally like these parts just came together so easily uh you know it's just a classic groove like a classic house groove that with a good vocal sample you know that's all it needed it just needed that and just the structure and just making sure like that hype stayed there was pretty much the basis of this record and every time I play it or every time Eric plays it it just it's a fucking vibe like it's such a good vibe gets people dancing and kept like you know you just start seeing people moving and, and having fun to it bass line Like, like, if you can't dance to that, you, you can't talk to me. Like, that's just how it goes.
I think another reason why I love this record is like, it, it, it just feels like a New York record to me. Reminds me of the city, it reminds me of the 90s, it just reminds me of like a good time in a club. And that's all I want my music to remind people of, you know, just a good time. And this one, like, just it just brings the party. I think uh, what everyone likes about it is this part, like where she goes shaking my ass. I'm shaking that ass. But overall, I don't know what it is. This is my favorite drop right here. I just love the part where she says, ow. I just think it's so relatable for New Yorkers. I don't know, it has a special place for me, that drop. This one was simple. Like, I banged this out maybe three hours. Little did I know what I had on my hands. I really didn't think, like, this track was gonna blow it up. Shaking that ass. <laughs> Shit. It's crazy. Literally haven't been here since it's closed. I maybe even before it like yeah. closed, like before like because they had a, a rough run yeah. after Yeah, Icon never really made it from there. It yeah. The yeah, no, once it turned Icon Lounge, that was it. I'll always call this building Deco Lounge. I'll never call it Icon. It's just how it is. So this is Deco Lounge. This is the second club I ever got a shot of playing for the most part as a young uh, adult. I just turned 18 and I was officially allowed to play in this room. So Club Abyss and Deco Lounge were owned by R3 Ventures, Dimitri and Costa. And uh, big shout out to them for letting me do this, by the way. Yeah, you would come in this room. Every Wednesday was Wildlife Wednesdays. That was a mix of everything. It was house music. It was, you know, uh, hip hop downstairs. You would still play hip hop in the main room too, but this place would be packed. You couldn't breathe in here, it was so busy. You could have a little bit of everything in one room and it just made sense. And this was like the only club I've ever experienced where you could hear a hip hop track and a house record in the same night and everyone was still vibing and it was still a good time and like going back to making music and everything like that all those experience of coming into a room and, and having an amazing time completely like influenced my whole album for the most part and all the experiences of being a young adult in a nightclub where i'm really not technically allowed until i'm 21 but they were able to do 18 plus here it was an amazing experience like I'm looking at these walls, I'm looking at the sound system, I'm looking at everything and I'm just getting complete throwbacks from when I was a kid. I realized how grateful I was at that time to experience this because after this closed, there was nothing like it in uh, New Jersey at all. You know, there was nothing that like hit me as special as this room because this was the start and this was where everything, you know, I heard things for the first time in this room. I heard DJs like um, Marco Carolla when I was 18 in this room. And like, who the hell would have thought Marco Carolla would come to New Jersey? You know what I mean? Like just little things like that. Super blessed for that opportunity to just experience this. You know, this was the main, this was the main room. This is where everything went down. Originally, the DJ booth was right in the middle. Pretty much everything, you know, is a little bit different, but like the, the format of the club is still here. So like this was the DJ booth when it was Deco. Um, obviously the two bars right here. And then this was kind of like, they would do small VIP section. And what I loved the, the most about this club was it was never about, you know, popping bottles. It was always about the dance floor and just having a good vibe on the floor. I miss that big time. This was a super special room. I'll never forget like the first big night I played here. They had um, Steve Aoki here, which is super weird for me to play before Steve Aoki when you think of it. But like in this room, it just worked. So I was playing Tech House and Techno before Steve Aoki came on. I made an edit of Release Me by Veronica. I played it here for the first time and the room just went off. And then I remember making uh, an edit for Taking a Life 
that also went off, which were like those two tracks were kind of big T night records for me too. So it was cool to correlate that here and bring it to, you know, Deco. The fun experience was I was like the baby in the group. I was only 18 and all my other friends were in their mid twenties. So to show that I knew an older style of music or something that they could relate to was something special too. And I'll never forget the room just going off, like insane. Those are memories I'll just always never forget. They're, they're special. I'll take you. This track came about um, my boy Xander, which is his real name is Alexander. Up and coming New York kid. I love the fact that he's from New York. Uh, super fucking talented, man. Like super talented. You know, I met him. We were at, I think it was Analog at the time it was called. Truncate was playing. My boy Truncate was playing. Alex, I was in the DJ booth and Alex threw me a USB stick. And I was like, this was like, three or four years ago, I think. And I was like, he's throwing me a USB stick? I was like, is this is this for Trunky? He's like, no, he pointed and he was like, it's for you. I was like, oh shit, all right, cool. I didn't even know like someone would recognize me like that. Like, sweet, like this is the first USB stick I'm getting thrown at me. So I was like, all right, let's see. Usually when someone gets a USB stick, it's usually like, eh, whatever, cool. You know, sometimes the music isn't the best, but it is what it is. I pop in the USB stick when I get home and I was like, oh shit, like this, this kid's got something, like this is cool, like this is someone I could really mess with from New York, like, you know, maybe help him out as much as I can and, um, you know, help him with some connections and, you know, play the shit out of his music, I love his sound, you know, he's came here a few times, we've jammed, he's a guitarist, I was on the drums, we were having fun, he sent me this track during the pandemic we were like yo let's work on something like let's let's be productive you know so he sends me this groove right here and i was like that's it i was like i don't i don't, I don't know what it was it's just this a raw techno groove and it's just I'll take you. so now you heard the vocal but i was driving to my girl's house and i don't know what it was i I pulled over on the side of the road and I recorded this vocal and you could actually see on this vocal the name of the street my girl lives on. I recorded it. I was listening to this, this groove in my car. I was like, I don't know what hit me, but I came up with this vocal. I'll take you to this place where we all can be free. I'll take you to this place where we all need to be. I'll take you, take you, take you, take you. I'll take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. And being that it's from an iPhone, like it, it sounds pretty clean, but like I didn't get like the true, like, you know, what I would get from a microphone, but like it, the one take that I just did in my car was enough. Like that's all I needed for it. And um, the minute I laid this vocal in the track, I, I literally threw it on my laptop. The minute I walked into my girl's house, I was like, I said hi to everyone. I went upstairs. And I threw this vocal Take it on. to this place where we all can be free. I'll take it to this place where we all need to be. I'll take it to this place where our world comes alive. I'll take it to this place where the dark is the light. I'll take you. And, you know, I pieced together a few parts. So, like, you can hear it now. And very simple parts, but over the groove, it just, it... It carries so much more. I'll take you. So I added this synth, some pads behind it, and a few more pads on top. And it just created some emotion behind the behind the groove and the vocal. I'll take you to this place where we all can be free. I'll take you to this place where we all Place where we all can be free. I'll take 
Now, when I made this track, I pictured like club going the fuck off. Like, like this is the bomb of the night. And pretty much like the vocals are saying, I'll take you to this place where we all can be free. Like I was thinking about during that time, it was the pandemic. Uh, I was thinking about like what got stripped away from us. I was like, you know, one place that you could really be yourself and be free and, and, you know, a place that you just have complete you know, freedom for is a club and it's a place where you can just be yourself. And that's where the vocals came from. I don't know how I got that out of myself. I don't know what inspired it, but I just pictured, you know, a nightclub packed, the rooms going off and, you know, what that feeling is to just be, you know, free on the dance floor with your hands up, having a good time and, and just enjoying the night. You know, the vocals say, I'll take you to this place where we all need to be. I'll take you to this place where we all can be free. I'll take you. That's what it means to me. That's what the club scene is. And then with everything behind it, it just... It all came together so fast. And, you know, like, there's only, like, 17 or, like, 15 tracks on this track, on this record. You know, it just shows that, not, you know, it doesn't need to be completely, like, complex like you know if you have good parts and you have good hooks good melodies a good vocal a, you know good drum pattern and, and a good bass line like that's all you really need and this track is like a true example of just keeping it simple keeping it raw keeping it on the ground and like it, it's just it has everything i want in an underground record and uh the minute i made this shit i just saw myself playing this at like a big room like time warp or something like that I, I can't wait to play that shit live. Like when I made this, I, I was like, I can't wait to play this live and just see how the room reacts. And so far, every time I played it, I get the question like, yo, what is that? Who is that? What is that? It's, it's a good feeling. Take it to this place where we all can be free. I'll take it to this place where we all need to be. I'll take it to this place where our world comes alive. I'll take it to this place where the dark is alive. So we are at Time Warp New York. It's my second time playing in Time Warp. Um, it's always special, something crazy. I never thought I'd play this, but um, I guess dreams come true sometimes, right? Being from New York and seeing the brand come here is uh, really amazing. You know, they, uh, they always go balls to the walls with like production and all that stuff. So it's, it's really amazing. The lineup's stacked tonight. So it's, it's, I'm excited, it's gonna be fun. And uh, I can't wait. So I'm starting things off from like 10 to 12, and then Pam Pop comes on after me. So it should be really good. This is how it pretty much started, like I said, with this synth. And then I just started building the fundamentals, you know, kick drum behind it, hi-hat, second hi-hat, and most of that is the 909. I like to just stick to the originals, like all the, you know, proper drum machines. Um, and then I started coming in with like a few extra synths like this, which this inspired the bass line that I wrote. So that synth inspired this sound. 
and I just doubled it pretty much. And then the moving force behind it is this arpeggiated sound. Which I wanted to create, like, I, I knew that there was going to be a vocal on it the minute I started writing parts like that. So, like, I wanted atmosphere behind my vocal. I wanted the vocal to feel big, dramatic, and almost make you feel lost. And a big, big 90s vibe for me. I'm a big 90s fan. I was born in the 90s. And um, the minute I wrote this, I knew what I wanted from the music video to everything. I knew the vibe that I was going for already. There's just little things like these pads, which I fell in love with. This, this moves the whole record for me. And I just kept messing with the automation on the cutoff and all the filters on it. But um, like when I solo the vocal with the pads, it's like something that just gets you lost. Things could be different. I feel like I fell through. Your wait is over. So come on, take the wheel. And now you're watching. Cause I can't. Now in this part, I remember, I remember writing this, and um, it was coming time to sing it. Um, I was scared to wake everyone up in the house. I didn't want to, you know, start like screaming or anything. So I remember like being very subtle with my voice, and it actually worked in my my favor. Like it didn't, you know, I didn't come out yelling or anything like that. It just worked. <laughs> And then the day after, this track took me like maybe, I finished everything in one day and then I made changes the following day. I remember asking my dad if he could come down and sing the harmonies for me. So the next day my dad came down and he sang his harmonies. Which for me, it's like, it's really surreal to go upstairs and ask your dad to sing a harmony for you you know in my opinion this is probably the most versatile record i've written to date um it shows like my true colors from being from new york originally and and showing like how i grew up listening to house and dance music might not be techno which that's fine i just wanted to show another side of myself and um you know to go upstairs and say hey dad can you come down and just sing this harmony for me like uh, I, I need it done it's a really cool moment to have someone who's inspired you for your whole life musically and you know to have him a part of my album is really special it's like it means everything to me family is the most important part of my life so like to have that on my album is is everything for me so this is the harmonies with my vocal. So this is all my Korg uh, mini log right here. It's got a real big resonance on the filter, which like creates that huge atmosphere on it. So when it's chilled in the mix, you just...
And then this part comes in. I remember sitting back after I wrote everything and the track was done, the harmonies were in, and I just said to myself, I finally did it. I finally made a record that I'm super proud of. Whether, like I said, it's techno, house, regardless, I don't, I don't really care about the genre. It's just something for me to express, and it's the full production aspect of it. It's the vocals, it's the melody, it's the pads, it's the drum grooves, it's it's everything. It's a full on record rather than just, you know, certain, you know, techno records are a little bit more stripped back and, you know, a little bit more simple. I wanted to show my true colors with, you know, full on production, which is for me, you know, everything that I want to accomplish as a producer. So this is uh, in my mind. It was, uh, I would say, a full-on experience for me to make. I'm, uh, I'm really proud of this one. All right, so the correct way to say my name is a vision. A lot of people say a vision, or I've heard a vision, it's a vision. That's it, very simple. Yeah, I mean, it's all part of the process. I, I think criticism is a way of growing. And if someone doesn't like something that I really love, then they can go kick rock. <laughs> Pretty much, a hand of criticism, great. <laughs>